Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering Knowledge 16, brought to you by ServiceNow. Here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Jeff Frick. We're back at Knowledge 16, welcome. This is theCUBE, theCUBE is SiliconANGLE's flagship program. We go out to the events, we extract the signal from the noise for you, our audience. John Reimer is here, he's a vice president and principal analyst at Forrester Research. We're going to talk developers. John, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Good, my favorite subject. So we learned today that you and your colleague, Clay, what was Clay's last name? Clay Richardson. Clay Richardson coined the term low-code developer. So low-code platforms. Yep. Low-code platforms, that's where it started. Yep. And then evolved, of course, into low-code developer, no-code yep. developer, and yep. citizen developer. Right? It has taken on a life of its own. So what was the concept? Take us back to the formation of that concept. What were you guys thinking at the time? We were trying to come up with a term to describe a, a set of customer behaviors uh, and, and a set of products that we were, we were researching, in the, you know, researching in the field. So we found customers that were choosing uh, application development platforms that allowed them to work very, very quickly. So that meant not only declarative tooling as opposed to coding, but it also meant self-service, very low cost, if any, to get started, build something small, keep going, and keep going. And so there were a set of products that, uh, that, you know, conf that, that basically satisfied that need, um, but they were all kind of random. So it was like, well, these, these products seem to have something in common. What are we going to call it? And one of, the, one of the proposals was no code, which I rejected because nobody will believe it. <laughs> uh, so I said, look, it, there's always code. There's always code. The point here is to try to devote your precious coding resource only when you absolutely have to. And when you can get, when you can deliver the app without coding, that's a huge productivity gain, a huge gain in speed and so forth. Hence, low code. Now how long ago was this that you guys? This was uh, two years ago. Now, okay, well you, what you just described of you know, sort of low cost, speed, start small and grow, it's kind of what's on the mind of developers, but let me ask you the question. What is on the mind of developers today? How has it evolved over the last two years? So those, those uh, concerns are still, still remain in place. I think they going, so moving on from trying to basically introduce uh, new tooling and new, pro new processes, like agile and continuous integration and so forth, to speed up coding and introducing low code. Now people are basically trying to scale it up. So when the low in low code, people are, are trying to basically apply these platforms very, very broadly. That, you know, for not only for the departmental and sort of glue kinds of applications, but really their full portfolio and really tackle mission critical, tackle all kinds of scenarios. And uh, and you know the early uh, the early adopters are having a lot of success there. We 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 have a lot of confidence that that we're at the tip of the iceberg here. There's going to be a lot more adoption. So we, we go around a lot of these events and you see, I mean, the developer events are some of the big ones. They're obviously the Worldwide Developer Conference, Google I.O. is this week, Facebook's Developer Conference. Yep. Um, uh, clearly Microsoft for years has had a, a developer affinity. And then you see you know, entrance like from Cloud, Cloud Foundry, um, yep. um, IBM, at all of its events now has sort of little spin outs. EMC even, at EMC World had a thing called Code. So everybody's trying to get in the, in the act. They covet developers. Um, and now you see ServiceNow put up a sign and say, okay, we're going to have a little code. And then the place gets swamped. 3,000 people. Right, and so it's, 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 it's ironic to me that you have a low code developer culture de de you know, burgeoning here. And I juxtapose that to some of the others. Now some of them, obviously Apple, Swamped. Yeah. Everybody wants to, you know, participate there. But what do you make of that phenomenon of ServiceNow's developer community? Well, ServiceNow has a developer community and is trying to expand it. I mean, mm -hmm. the bottom line is that that uh, ServiceNow uh, has an opportunity to really apply its technology much more broadly, as do other vendors, you know, in this space. Um, the opportunity here is. That what they're really what they're what they're really doing is trying to fill a shortage. They're just everybody's concerned about developers because developers are crucial now for all business activities. You can't you can't produce 
of any business innovation or any business, uh, you know, any business uh, uh, change now without software. You either need new software or changes to existing software. And there just are not enough coders to go around. Nowhere, nowhere close to enough coders to go around. So the vendors like ServiceNow that have low code uh, approach have the opportunity to help their, their clients essentially expand their developer community beyond just the coders, empower more folks who understand a business process or understand a, an analytic uh, approach or understand you know, customer behavior and, and, and what customers might respond to, to actually produce software or at a, at a minimum really influ positively influence the production of software. I, I think we're, I think this low code phenomenon that we're seeing is gonna result in just a different, a whole new community of people coming into software delivery, uh, a much bigger community, and that's how we're gonna solve this gap. What, what are some other examples? Because you see, you see some pretty intense code at some of these, like AWS, you know, sure. the yeah, hoodie but I, crowd. And, but I thought so, Pat made an interesting comment this morning, Pat Casey, yeah. about somebody that was an app developer and made an app and had no clue that they were an app developer and made an app. Yep. They built a workflow <laughs> yep. and they didn't build an app. And he's like, well, is there data involved? Yeah. Is there process involved? Yeah. Is there notifications involved? Yeah. You, you know, so it, back to your point, it, it wasn't a developer in the hardcore sense writing code, right. but the output um, was an app. a quote unquote an app. Quote unquote an app. Right. right. Exactly. This is exactly how we're going to, this is exactly how we're going to fill this, this gap is to broaden the community, because not, not, there are different kinds of apps, right? If I'm writing, if I'm gonna go and write the next great Java framework or the next great you know, service on AWS, well, I'm, I'm probably a hardcore coder. Yeah, I'm right. probably, probably I'm even a DevOps person. I'm, I'm, in, the, I'm in configuring infrastructure as well. Um, you know, there's a lot of business apps that don't require that level of skill. So let's not, Let's, you, let's basically devote those people to the tasks where they're really, where they're, they're most needed. Right. And a lot of business apps, in fact, can be built by developers that have, their, their primary value is they understand the business. They understand the vertical industry or they understand the, the business process. So I think, I think we're going to see this, uh, uh, much, much more of this as we go forward. Have universities picked up on this? And, and is their curriculum emerging? to support low-code development? Uh, or? Not that I've seen, but I'll admit I haven't looked very hard. Should there uh, be, in your view? Absolutely. Or? I mean, yeah. I think that uh, one thing, that, one thing I, that I feel like is that we, we as an industry don't really have language to talk about this productively. So people talk about citizen developer. Well, what is that? Mm. You know, we talk about uh, um, business, business uh, uh, analysts. And you know there are different roles that we talk about. There, we really don't have precise, you know, definitions for these roles. So therefore, how can we possibly train for them? How can we possibly even recognize who these people are? So I think I hopefully the hopefully will. I, I, what I'm hoping to see is that we'll we'll somehow come up with a way of recognizing people who have technical ability, but their real value is solving business problems. So there, it's this melding between a, a developer and a business analyst kind of a kind of a role. So I mean, Benioff kind of got it right when he said there'd be more SaaS companies coming from outside of the technology industry oh, than, yeah. than inside yeah. the technology. And that's part of the big reason for the shortage. Um, yep. And so, when you, when you, but in, in those business people can envision an outcome and if they could develop an app to make it happen, that would be a good thing. But what do they need to do that? They need a they need a platform, like ServiceNow, for example, or or, or others. Or, or, yeah. yeah, they need. Yeah. And so they need the right tools. They need a platform that is managed, rather than yeah, an yeah. app right. that right. maybe runs on their that generates a file that runs on Joe's uh, runs on a laptop under Joe's desk. They right. need a managed platform, and uh, and I, frankly, I think they need some additional skills. They need to know what an app is. Not everybody, not all business people are going to be good at this. Um, you know, building an app that's going to be used by other people, you have to have a certain, you have to have an ability to think with a certain abstractness about the experience of it, about the algorithms or the data that's, that are going to go into that, that are going to go into that app or the process flow. 
Um, so I think I'd like to see the university sort of uh, step up to this to sort of equip people to take their business talents and their, and their gumption and, and be more effective in creating apps. Well, even in the high schools, I mean, everybody takes biochem and physics, you know, why isn't CS one of those? Right. Either one of those options, you take, you take four math classes, you right. take four English classes, you right. take the four, or, you know, I'm not gonna be a biologist, I'm not gonna be pre-chem, you know, should CS be the third, you know, take three of the four, CS being one of them, because, because as you said, there's not enough skill and talent and it's, it just hasn't been, you know, the demand for as technologically savvy as we are and those kids that are on the bleeding edge that are running through the schools, you know, the schools are so far behind in, in kind of making that a core piece of, of, of their basic language, it's, right? You know, it, the, the recent grads that I've talked to, the, it's, a, it's not quite that bad, I, I, I suspect. Recent grads I've talked to, many of them, it's like they're in engineering disciplines and all that, they do take coding. They, so they at least, they'll take like a Java class or a, a C class or something like that. So at least they're getting introduced to, you know, that sort of structured thinking about, about information and, and, and logic and so forth. Um, I, think we've, I think essentially we're, what we're seeing is an over-rotating on computer science. And, you know, there's a need for that. But, you know, business develop, a lot of people doing business apps, they can be successful without a comp sci background. Absolutely, they mm -hmm. can be successful. So it's, this is why I say, I think we're struggling with the language to even mm -hmm. describe what we need. Mm -hmm. Here we are, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> well, kind yeah. of fumbling around. <laughs> and, and the other new dynamic is data. You mentioned data, and we yeah. always talk about the cube is data is the new developer kit. And, and, and you know, back in the day, logic and structure, yes, but now data is a fundamental part of the process of building an app. Couldn't agree more. Time you start there. Talk about that dynamic a little bit. I couldn't agree more. The, so, much of, so much of the value going forward is understanding, is being able to think creatively about data and about, uh, about correlating data, about you know, relating data, both to basically do, um, to create analyses that have integrity, because there's a lot of junk out there, but, but um, to be able to think creatively about data and, and then figure out how you can, how you can act on that. But, you know, and people, are, people these days are doing some amazing things with customer data, um, and we haven't even scratched the surface yet on, on device data, on the so-called Internet of Things. There's a lot of it that's being collected, but we still, there's a lot to, uh, you know, there's a lot more to do with it. And it does play into a developer's mindset in terms of, okay, if we can get the data, how can we process them? What do we do with it? What's the process it kicks off? Or what's the view that we, the notification maybe we send out to, an, uh, to a, uh, a customer or the view that we create for the manager? And, and you know, how should that evolve? I, I agree with you. I think this is the, the and, and next big thing. That brings visualization into it as well. I mean, the gamers obviously have had to always worry about that, but now just the business analyst Absolutely. has to worry about that. John, talk about some of your research in this area, some of the cool stuff you guys are doing, some of the things you're proud of, some interesting findings, you know, have at it. Okay, thank you. We're um, certainly, the low code research is about two years old. We've, we've been working on it for about two years and there's a lot more to do. Uh, there's a lot of demand from clients, a lot of interest from clients in, in that research. So we've looked very heavily at, very heavily at the products. Uh, we've looked at things like, do they scale? Uh, we've looked at, we've compared products. The next set of things we really are going to go after are governance. So if I bring in a low-code platform and I've already got Java or .NET or what have you in-house, how do I use these things together? How do I decide which apps to do on which platforms? And um, a lot of people struggle with that. They, uh, you can do a lot. Doesn't mean you should do a lot, you know that kind of thing. <laughs> one of the one of the examples we saw was one of the low-code platforms was a large insurance company, brought in the, one of the low-code platforms. Again, it, it was not a strategic it was not a strategic choice. It just came in. They ended up with seventeen thousand applications completely unmanaged, on this on this platform. <laughs> that's not good. That's a problem. Anyway, governance is a big deal. That's that's one of the next things we're going after. And then we're also going after this question of, of who are these developers? Who are the low-code developers? How do you find them? You know, can you, can you transition coders? You know, 
If, if so, which ones? Because a lot of coders look at these products and say, yeah. not for me. Toys. Not right. for me. The toys, they're wrong, but... Right, but, it, but but the, they're you know, snobs. Such as such as life. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, so it's anyway. kind of the uh, you know are they born or are they created? Because because I would uh, hypothesize that trying to find them is probably the wrong the wrong way. It's it's trying to find the potential to make someone who isn't which the is low code coder, which, right? Which is spot on, absolutely spot on. People, uh, you know, back you mentioned that people come out from outside of ComSci, and you know they always have. When I when I first got involved in the computer industry back when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Uh, most of the developers I ran into, or a lot of them anyway, came out of anthropology backgrounds. Why was that? But clearly they weren't comp site people, but they were effective. So who, what, are, what is that combination of background, sort of, sort of just aggressiveness, uh, interest in solving problems, you know, business problems that we need to, that we can, that we can uh, highlight to find, to basically you know, find these people and promote them. Have you seen any good examples in your uh, client base of organizations deliberately saying, okay, hey, we have an opportunity to fill the gap and we are going to deliberately go out and create a framework and a training and a, and a process, a growth path for low-code developers? Not much, but not much. huge opportunity, I would imagine. Huge right? opportunity, yeah. uh, not much. I did, I have seen some. Uh -huh. uh, just, was, just was speaking with a gentleman the other day that's using one of the low-code uh, platforms and they're starting small, so they've got two people uh, that, are, that are working on this environment. And by the way, that's one of the benefits of, of low code. They're so productive. You don't need 100 people, mm -hmm. you know? But anyway, two people. His, his go-to developer um, does not have a comp sci background. He is a person that he found who just had technical ability and, and just was really good at solving business problems. And, and that's what he... That's what he got up in the morning thinking about, and and so it, it is this sort of combination of tech skills, you know, ability to to find their way around a tool, and the ability to think productively and creatively about business problems. So I've seen he he's now this person has now got that model and is starting to look in his organization for others like that. But generally, no, we're we're all as an industry, I think casting about trying to figure out who these people and, are. And do you think, and in that case specifically, is that person now, is that their full-time job? Yes. Or will the low-code developers of the future be just part of the other things in which they do? And That's a really depending on time of year, what's the priority, you know, the percentage of time shifting to that type of activity versus other things uh, will be different or flexible. That's a really good point. Um, the, most, in most cases, you'll see people set these products up as essentially centers of excellence. So the people who work doing applications, building applications, are full-time. But if we're going to actually expand the base out, as you say, and we're going to have business people who are, doing, who are producing software as they need it, then I think we will get into, well, this is part of my job, but it's not all of what I do. I'm not a full-time uh, full software deliverer producer. Right, right. Um, that's more the citizen developer idea, um, which again, we're struggling, to, we're struggling to, to figure out exactly how to organize that. But I think it's coming. We're talking to John Reimer, Forrester Research. Good stuff, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you guys. Sharing Thank your insights. you. Good to see you. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest. We're winding down the third day of theCUBE coverage at Knowledge16. Be right back. We have hundreds and maybe thousands